Uh, it's great to be here. It's great to see all the, the, the work that's being done at the experiment stations. My name is Matt Kochka. I'm a master's student in studying plant biology and strawberries under the advisement of Yago Hale, who's a um, specialty crop, uh, I mean, a assistant professor in specialty crop improvement. My, uh, my thesis project is on annualized strawberry uh, plasticulture production in New England. And I'm looking at it from sort of three different views. It's the actual feasibility of how to grow uh, these, the grow of strawberries in this method in New England. Uh, also look at the economics of producing strawberries and the, the standard method, as well as the economics uh, of this method. And then also looking at uh, how to avoid and um, manage one particular pest that is, uh, there are rumblings that have become a bigger pest in the, in the region. To start, I want to um, start with getting us all on the same page of what all of these methods are. Um, starting with matted row production systems. This is the standard production system in New Hampshire. Basically, um, the major difference between the proposed um, method is the proposed the proposed method. Um, the, the major differences are uh, the plant material, uh, the timing of planting. And um, and the way it's treated in the winter. Um, so in matted row, growers use bare, bare root dormant crowns, and they plant really sparsely in the bed, and allow the the the, um, the reproductive method of strawberries to fill in the beds. That's sending out daughters, um, you know, runners' daughters, and it's basically cloning itself. It saves the grower a lot of money in establishing beds, and then. Uh, these are planted in the spring, and it takes a whole year of establishment before a grower can uh, reap a harvest. And then they're under they're underwintered, overwintered under straw. Uh, straw is uh, becoming more expensive, so this is becoming an issue. Um, and then there's you know there's a perennial nature to this whole system, and you know growers are trying to get two two to three years of harvest out of three to four years of growing the, the crop. So basically. You know, you plant for one year uh, and wait for the establishment, and then you harvest the next year, and then a consecutive year. And then if you're lucky, you can get a third year of harvest out of four years of the, the plants being in the ground. Plasticulture system. This is the, the dominant system in the major producing areas in this continent, uh, being you know California, North Carolina, um, Florida, and Ontario, and Quebec. And it's... Uh, a much more rapid turnover. It's a more capital-intensive system, but basically the difference is is that beds are, are raised beds are made covered in plastic. Uh, green plants are planted at high density through the plastic. Um, they're planted in the fall. Uh, in New England, that would be September, and then they're harvested the next June. And the grower has the option to, you know. Uh, till under those plants in the, in the, after the first harvest, or continue with uh, June, I mean, ever bearing plants and harvest throughout the whole summer. And we're also looking at the potential to take it from annualized system like in California and maybe make it into a two year program to really recoup that initial high uh, uh, capital intensive planting system. And then we overwinter it under a um, a floating row cover, which uh, is a major critique of this system in our area because the floating row cover provides a lot less insulation. But um, we'll see how that pans out in, in, in these studies. And you know, as, as uh, researchers at the Ag Experiment Station, we're trying to help growers understand the answer or develop an answer for this question. Is it worth it to rock the boat? Is it worth it to look at this this sort of innovative system in New England. And the factors that are most important in making this decision are, <clears throat> you know, is, is the investment going to be worth the, uh, the yield? So we're looking at time, and preliminary um, observations are showing that time is about the same. That's including planting and maintaining the crop, weeding. Um, materials cost is you know, maybe three times higher in annual plastic culture systems, but the opportunity cost is where, where, where we can recuperate a lot of that initial investment. Yield, um, 
yeah, previous previous um, estimations of yield were were very negative on this system, but even with some of the problems we have, we're seeing that the yields can be very comparable to um, matted row and potentially even higher. And disease risk, this is another big factor. Because we have the, the, the flexibility to um, move the crop every year and as a, uh, using it as an annual, we can get effective crop rotation and you know, effectively hide the, the strawberries from the diseases that are laying in the, the soil. This is, a fun, this is a fun chart for everyone to look at. So this is a, I um, can't really tell the difference of the colors, but this is a three-year calendar comparing the incomes and expenses between the two systems. And the, uh, is the red one? Yeah. The most important section to look at is this first year. Um, we have the, 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 this is really supposed to be more of a, a spring. This is an expense line. There's an initial expense of cultivating and then planting uh, the matted rose strawberries. And then, you know, that expense line stays high. You have to maintain all the crop and it costs money to maintain the crop for throughout a whole season without having a green income line. Uh, you don't start seeing green income lines until the next year. So over these two years, two, I mean, over these three years, you only get two years of income. Um, but in the plastic culture system, you have the flexibility of adding another cash crop before you plant your strawberries. Um, if I were to start the, the um, I'll use this. <laughs> if I were to start the, the, the years from winter, I mean, I could have started, you know, plant the strawberries in this winter or this fall, and you would just see normal income lines that represent or that match this. Um, so this income could be, you know, forty thousand dollars an acre or more. It could be, you know, anything that grows and comes to maturity between uh, planting it in May or June and harvesting it in August. So that's a wide range of crops, and that's a huge potential income. And then there's, you know, some people, some growers like to use um, ever-bearing or day-neutral strawberries that, you know, produce fruit throughout the whole growing season, and then some just like to use June bears. And we, we added this dotted line for the ever-bearing harvest because a lot of the uh, cultivars that are being put out right now, uh, all of the, a lot of the uh, ever-bearing cultivars are well suited to plastic culture systems, but really terrible in matted row. They don't send out daughters, they don't clone themselves as well as uh, others. So, you know, if you plant them dense in a plastic culture system, you will reap a, a, a quality harvest. So why rock the boat? Number one is, uh, well, I guess you really can't rank these, but I've been doing a lot of surveys with growers and finding that, you know, when you read the books, it says you should be able to get three years of harvest minimum out of the strawberry planting that you're keeping in there for uh, a perennial system. But a lot of the growers are being limited to two years of production, so that's two thirds of, of, of the life cycle of a field are being harvested only in one third is not being harvested so that's a problem well, wrong button. Um, annual production is shown to be more profitable in major growing regions that I mentioned including the ones north of us straw prices are rising organic interest is, is growing so there aren't a lot of options for controlling soil borne soil borne pests for organic growers um, and conventional growers for that matter and then a lot of new growers are getting into the uh, the business of farming and they, ha they don't really have the systems to deal with their weeds quite yet so plastic culture can uh, address that and then a lot of the new uh, varieties that are coming out are really suited to plastic culture systems and they're providing traits like, like fruit yield, fruit size, color and flavor that aren't really available in our traditional matted row um, cultivars which aren't really getting bred anymore well they are which is not as much and then that's the background. Those are the, the impetus for the research. And the research, again, is the, the three, three things here. Uh, field trials, economics, and soil-worn pathogens. So the deer were helpful once. They, they made it so I didn't have to renovate the strawberries at all. 
but they also they ate our, our strawberries in the winter. They actually pawed through our, our winter cover, and then they got us in the spring, and they got us you know when we wanted to renovate. So we now have a 10-foot fence around the whole ag experiments. The um, this is Kingman Farm, so we don't have to worry about them skewing our results. But what we're looking at in the field trials are plastic versus matted row next to each other. We're looking at four different cultivars, two June bearers and two um, day neutrals. And uh, you know, we're using the systems that I, that I, uh, that I outlined. And uh, the preliminary results, I'm not gonna put up numbers because we're still trying to figure out how to deal with uh, deer, deer uh, influences. But even, even with the deer issues, we were able to get you know 10% lower yield, which is not a good thing. We were we only we only lost ten percent of the yield compared to um, matted row. So we got ninety percent of the yield of matted row even with deer pressure. Can you stress the, the deer the deer damage was severe. It was ridiculous. <laughs> so that that you still had ninety percent of yeah. what we're seeing on average in the state after deer destroyed but, the field. And the, and this was just for the spring harvest. And then when you add the fall harvests, um, we're pretty close to 150% of the yield. And that's just depending on whether a grower wants to deal with you know, marketing uh, strawberries in the fall. I mean, I say fall, the rest of the summer. Um, a lot of growers are reluctant to deal with strawberries once they've got that June flush. Um, and they, they're not sure if, um, customers really want to go out there and pick them in August. So. So the economics, this, this is a, a sort of a two-pronged approach at looking at it. Uh, I'm doing one hour long grower surveys looking at just about every input that it takes to raise a strawberry in their system. Um, you know, it's spray, the spray regime, weed control, um, you know, plant materials, labor and all that, as well as looking at the, asking them about their yields and how they market their, their strawberries. And I'm trying to overlay that data into the work that I'm doing so that we can develop enterprise budgets, uh, both for matted row growers and potential plastic culture growers. And then we have comparative field trials. We're basically doing the same sort of uh, systems trials uh, that I just talked about, but these are much larger, um, just to really have a better um, view of how much labor it takes me to grow plastic culture strawberries and how does that relate to how much labor it takes me to grow the matted row strawberries. And mostly that's looking at like uh, plant, how long does it take to plant a field, how long does it take to weed a field, because um, spraying is going to be the same and a lot of this other inputs are going to be the same. So there are rumblings that there are nematodes amidst. Uh, and these are uh, root lesion nematodes. They're uh, a little microscopic worm that enters the strawberry root cortex and leaves a wide opening for other uh, fungal pathogens like Rhizoctonia and Pythium, which uh, Kirk is looking for, has yet to find them in, in New Hampshire, right? Yeah, in, in strawberries. Um, but they're causing. Uh, we're proposing. We're we're thinking that they might be causing these sort of strawberry black root rot-like symptoms in growers' fields. And these are all fields that um, growers were trying to get their third year of harvest out of. And you know this this grower's field looks okay, but they probably only got 70% of their hoped for harvest. This grower looks sort of more of the average and probably got 30, 40% of the hoped for harvest in the, the third year of harvest. And you know, that was pretty much a loss. That was actually a good section of, of his bed in the you know, fourth year of growing the strawberry third year of harvest. So we're taking, we were taking samples of the strawberry roots and looking at are there nematodes and um, we're finding them everywhere. Uh, we have yet to ID them so the, the extraction methods are pointing to the fact that it's probably um, root lesion nematode but we still have to do um, genetic analysis on those. So we're taking that and looking at taking the, the, the fact that there is most likely nematode damage happening in the fields and how can we uh, go one step beyond just trying to avoid the pests to actually controlling the pests. Um, so we're looking at uh, genetics in, in wheat that could actually suppress nematodes. We're taking one cultivar of 
a winter week, and looking at uh, that there's a, there's a small genetic difference between these two uh, genotypes in this cultivar, and um, one of them is showing, or has actually, I can say, that actually has been shown to suppress nematodes in another system. This is a new report out of UC Davis. Um, so we're looking in greenhouses to see if this gene is effective at suppressing the root lesion nematode that we're looking at. And we're really excited about this work because if, it, if, it, if one of these uh, genotypes shows to be actually more suppressive than the other, we have a pretty good clue that it's a, actually a because of the gene, and we can use that, um, that gene to be referenced across other, um, other crops, other species of plants, and uh, you know, hopefully incorporate that into systems to, to um, suppress nematodes. And that's the, the quick and dirty of it. And you know, it's great to be working at the Ag Experiment Station and hopefully taking suggestions from growers to um, you know, improve crops and can't be done without these folks. Um, my, my work can't be done without these folks. And uh, so just to let you know, I'm hoping to publish a whole bunch of documents that are useful to growers, uh, including you know, a larger uh, full report on this, um, as well as budgeting tools if people want to look at these systems in their own, their own farm. Um, and I'm still conducting interviews, so if any growers want to lend me an hour, that'd be great. Thanks.